Today's video is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30 day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash magstv or click the link in the video description below. G'day ladies and gents and welcome back to Star Citizen with Mags. Today we're going to be taking a look at another ship from the Star Citizen universe, however rather than another ship of the UEE, today we're taking a look at something a little more alien. The most powerful fighter that we know of from among the clans of the Vandal, this is the Glaive. Of the three known Vandal fighter designs, the other two being the Blade and the Scythe, the Glaive is the least common and the most advanced. It features a very similar physical design to the Scythe, however unlike the Scythe, the Glaive is symmetrical, featuring large blades for ramming and cutting on both wings rather than just the right wing as with the Scythe. According to the law of Star Citizen, the Glaive is an advanced fighter awarded only to the greatest pilots amongst the Vandal. This makes it as much a mark of rank and status amongst the Vandal as it does a fearsome fighter. As with all alien craft currently in Star Citizen, the Flyable Glaive is not a true Vandal fighter, but is rather a recreation constructed by the Asperia Corporation under contract with the United Earth Empire Navy. These recreations of the Glaive were originally intended to serve as aggressor fighters in advanced combat simulations, but some also found their way into the civilian market for collectors. The Asperia Glaive design itself is built on salvage wrecks of true Vandal designs by comparing common components and recreating them as closely as possible. This is important to note as true Vandal Glaives are often customised to the needs of the individual pilot or the Vandal clan that it is a part of. As such, the Asperia Glaive is a representation of a base model of the Glaive before any such personal or socially required customization of the craft has taken place. The Vandal craft differ in many ways from UEE fighters, so we'll be going through this ship in quite some detail. So, first things first, let's start with the cockpit. The pilots access the cockpit of the glaive, not by the cockpit canopy as you would see in most UEE fighters, but by an articulated floor that lowers from underneath the spacecraft. Pilots of the glaive also do not sit, but they lie down in a semi-prone position inside of the cockpit. While this differs greatly from UAE fighter designs, it is actually a rather excellent design for a space fighter once you consider the effect that G-forces have on a pilot and the level of maneuverability that Vandal ships are capable of achieving. Much like real world fighter pilots, the two primary forces that a combat pilot in Star Citizen needs to deal with are positive and negative G-forces. To put this simply, positive G-forces are generated during the acceleration involved in a strong pitch maneuver and result in a feeling of increased gravity in the direction the pilot would define as down. This forces the blood of the pilot's body down and away from their brain, often beyond the point of the heart's ability to replace it. The result is usually the pilot blacking out due to oxygen deprivation to the brain after a period of time. On the other hand, negative g-forces are the reverse of this and are much, much more dangerous. High negative g-forces are generated due to the acceleration of the pilot during long pitch down maneuvers and these force more blood into the brain than it can often take. The results of sustained negative g-loads can range from a bleeding nose, bleeding eyes and bleeding ears to ruptured blood vessels and arteries, internal hemorrhaging and permanent brain damage. And of course, death. Now I know what you're saying, but Mag, this is a game, none of that really matters. Well, Star Citizen is going for a quasi hard sci-fi kind of effect here, so I think it's worth taking into account the designs themselves and seeing whether or not they would actually work. And interestingly here, this would actually help. The prone position was tested all the way through World War II and heavily tested in jet aircraft and specifically jet fighter design going through the late 1940s into the 1950s. With the majority of the testing being focused around the idea of finding out whether or not a pilot could actually sustain higher levels of G-loading for longer periods of time while in the prone position as opposed to being in the seated position. And as it turned out, they could. 
Now, of course, the position came with a few drawbacks. It was relatively uncomfortable for the pilots over large periods of time. Due to the limitations of aircraft design in the period, it did actually impede the pilot's ability to see what was going on below him. And one of the more important ones was the pilot's difficulty in operating the controls of the aircraft. During the period of the testing of the prone position, fly-by-wire systems were not a thing in aircraft yet. So pilots were still operating hydraulically boosted, but traditionally mechanically linked control surfaces. These required quite a lot of strength and quite a lot of leverage in order to be able to manipulate. Lying in the prone position, the pilot simply didn't have enough leverage to be able to manipulate the controls reliably, and that is on the controls that he could operate at all in the first place. While lying in the full prone position, it was pretty much guaranteed that the pilot would be unable to operate rudder pedals. Now, while the rudder pedal issue was solved by putting the pilot into what was known as the semi-prone position, a position that had all the appearances of the pilot riding the seat of a motorcycle, which incidentally is actually what you can see in side of the glaive. The inability for the pilot to reliably operate the aircraft controls was never solved and as such the prone position never made it into mainstream fighter design. So why does any of that matter to Star Citizen? Well it's interesting that either intentionally or unintentionally the designers of the glaive have given the glaive a cockpit design that would actually offer an advantage to a Vandal pilot assuming that the Vandal have similar biological limitations and similar technology in regards to G-suits as humans do at exactly the same time period. The cockpit of the glaive is actually large enough that the pilot would be able to stretch out, solving a lot of the long distance, long duration flight problems. But more than that, the design for the cockpit of the glaive is nice and clear, allows extremely good visibility. So being in the prone position does not affect visibility here at all. More than that, in a spacecraft, you're not handling heavy control surfaces. The controls that the pilot manipulates here would be extremely light. They only feed information through to a computer, and the computer then interprets those controls, firing thrusters and manipulating gravity systems inside of the spacecraft itself in order to achieve its maneuverability. So all of the negative aspects of this particular seating arrangement are completely nullified by the technology of the time. But, at the same time, the prone position would still offer the same advantages to the pilot in regards to their ability to tolerate high G-loads and long sustained G-loads. Honestly, thinking about it, it's rather surprising that the UEE hasn't also built ships that have lie-down cockpits in order to take advantage of the same advantages. And speaking of advantages, there is actually one more advantage to this cockpit design that didn't actually occur to me until after I had a really good look at the ship itself. The cockpit opens down and out, forward, presenting the lower hull armour of the cockpit to the front of the spacecraft as the pilot is exiting. Not only does the drop-down design allow the pilot to exit the spacecraft very quickly, as he simply needs to step off the pedals to exit the spacecraft, but that hull armour also provides a barricade between potential hostile fire coming in on the freshly landed spacecraft and the pilot who is exiting the vessel. This is likely another case of deliberate design, as it is highly unlikely that any Vandal pilot with access to a glaive wouldn't also be trained in ground combat. This particular design affords the pilot some defence as he prepares himself to switch from being the fighter pilot providing air cover to engaging in the melee. So next up, let's talk about the rest of the glaive's overall design. Firstly, let's focus on the main body. The body of the glaive is almost skeletal. There are sections of the spacecraft that are completely open, allowing you to see the internal components. Overall, this gives the appearance of the hull itself being extremely weak and fragile, and it's, well, most certainly not all that well armoured. The glaive is extremely reliant on its own manoeuvrability to avoid all incoming enemy fire and never have to take the hit in the first place. On those few occasions where that fails, it's reliant on its shield systems to absorb the hit for it, saving that hit from actually hitting the hull. But should the glaive find itself in a situation where it is unable to maneuver and has its shields down, it is in a world of trouble. The skeletal design of the main hull means that all of the internal components are actually exposed and will immediately begin taking damage, if not critical damage, across the board 
the second the shields are down and it's under direct fire. The hull breaks in three pieces, one for each wing and the central fuselage, and this is very easy to trigger once you have direct fire on the spacecraft without a shield in the way. One or two good hits will quite nicely snap the spacecraft into pieces. Now this is actually incredibly bad for the pilot for more reasons than you may think. The spacecraft is actually capable of maneuvering and still flying with both of its wings broken off. It has access to enough thrusters to allow for that, and all of the key components to the ship's operation are in the central hull. However, the two primary weapon systems, not counting the blades, are mounted in the wings. When those wings are blown off, it leaves you with two size one lasers as your only offensive weapons that are functional on the spacecraft. The wings contain the missile systems, the main plasma weapons, and the blades. So since we're on the topic of maneuverability, let's talk about those thrusters after all. Now the main engines in the Glaive are two size 4 engines, so these are fairly significant. The Glaive is not a slow machine. But then it comes to the maneuvering thrusters. The core thrusters around the main fuselage are four size 2 thrusters, which are, um, well they're not the biggest around, but considering the size and mass of the spacecraft, these are quite significant. But these are not all it has. These four size 2 thrusters are supplemented by an additional 12 size 1 thrusters all on this airframe. This makes the Glaive one of the most maneuverable spacecraft available in Star Citizen at this time. Second to only the Xi'an Kartu L and possibly the Aegis Saber. Although I would like to take this in a one-to-one -one maneuvering fight against a Saber just to be sure on that one. So, having talked about the maneuvering systems, let's go back to the weapon systems. However, it is important to note with the weapon systems that at this time, this ship has not been finalized. While the weapons are fully functional, the ship itself may have some adjustments done to it yet. So when I talk about sizes here, because these have not been announced, even the size of the weapons has not been announced yet, I'm going to be comparing it against existing weapons within the game and making a few assumptions. So first things first, let's talk about those primary weapons. The forward arms of the Glaive contain two main weapon systems. The first is a set of plasma cannons, one in each arm, that run on the mounts for where the blade for the Glaive is also attached. Now these plasma cannons are extremely large in size, they're nearly the full length of the wing. They would look about the equivalent size to a class 5 weapon system, however I don't think they're actually quite that size. They look more, or they act more like class 4s. What's interesting about these weapons themselves is the projectile moves at about medium speed relative to other weapon systems that are available in the game at this time. However, the damage it does seems to be about the same regardless of whether it hits shields or armor. At this point, it doesn't look like it bypasses the shield systems, it just hits with so much force that it knocks the shields offline and continues to damage the hull as well. This effect makes these cannons extremely unique amongst all of the weapon systems that are available and they're clearly a vandal weapon. But as I said, the full specs and even the size has not been released for these just yet, although I'll be very surprised to find them anything smaller than size 4. Not that the size overly matters, I fully expect that these weapons will be hard fixed to the spacecraft and unable to be removed, sort of like the nose guns inside of the Vanguard Warden. Next up is the missile systems. Now in the blades themselves there is meant to be two missile racks, each containing four missiles of an unverified size. The weapons are present, however I can only ever get four missiles to launch from the system, so it looks like it's actually two size two missile racks rather than two size fours currently on the design, although that may change at a later point. These missile systems, well, they're standard high explosive missiles, there's nothing particularly interesting about them. They appear to be only size 1, they don't do incredible amounts of damage, they are useful after the plasma cannons have stripped the shields of something to release and apply a crippling amount of damage to take down a target. Beyond that, they're not that much use. Now there's one last thing to say about these three weapon systems that I've spoken about so far. They cannot be customized at all. You cannot swap any of the weapons out at this time. At this point, the only upgrades that are available for the blade that you can tinker with is for the cooling systems and for the power plants. Besides that, all of the weapons are hard fixed. You cannot change the missiles. You cannot change the main guns. You cannot change the chin guns. That's just the way it is. Now of course the last weapon system that needs to be spoken about is the blades on the wings themselves. They are not just there for show. 
One of the specializations of the Vandal species as a whole is an emphasis on melee combat, and they've taken this even to space. All Vandal fighters are equipped with some kind of blade or lance at some location on them that is designed to ram into the target, causing catastrophic levels of damage. In the case of the Glaive, both of the winglets each contain one large angled blade on each side. These blades are designed to snap off after impact with the target, so you will only get one good usage out of them, but the amount of damage that they apply is utterly devastating, and they are fully functional within the game. I have killed multiple people using the blades on this spacecraft before. There is, of course, one small catch with using these blades. These blades have the missile systems mounted inside of them near their base, so if you use them while you still have missiles loaded, well, the missiles won't detonate, but you will lose those missiles. It is also worth noting that there is a secondary use for these blades as well. They act extremely well as ablative armor if you need it, as their destruction does not interfere with any systems outside of the missile systems at any location on the ship. So if you are taking fire to the left or right or shot to the rear, you can rotate the spacecraft around rapidly and put one of the blades between the oncoming fire and the rest of your spacecraft, and it will absorb all of the damage. And once it reaches a point where it is absorbed enough, it will simply fall off. So that is the Glaive, ladies and gentlemen. Now there is one last thing that is worth discussing about the Glaive, at least briefly before we sign off. If you go through the specs of the Glaive on SIG's website, the RSI website, you will see that it does actually have a slot assignment for a special piece of equipment. But currently there is no information as to what that piece of equipment actually is. This makes me think that the Glaive is likely going to have some other kind of special usage outside of just being a highly aggressive and extremely nimble fighter. I also think it's highly likely that that special piece of equipment is going to change based on the pilot who is operating the Glaive or the clan that the Glaive has come from. It is likely going to be something that differentiates it from any of the other clans, fighters in particular. Anyways, ladies and gents, I hope you enjoyed the video and this look at the Vandal Glaive. Currently, it is the only flyable Vandal ship inside of Star Citizen, and it's relatively rare too, which is why I thought you guys may actually like to take a look. Anyways, until next time, if you have not created a Star Citizen account yet and you would like to take a look at the game, I have a link in the video description down below to my Star Citizen account. Signing up to the link and creating an account is free of course, you won't have to spend any money on Star Citizen at all until you actually wish to start playing the game. Now when you do decide to purchase a starter pack and get into Star Citizen, you will receive an extra 5,000 credits for signing up with my link to start the game with, and I also get a little bit of a bonus on my end as well, which helps me be able to make these videos on the channel. Also, don't forget to check out my sponsor for the channel. It is Audible, www.audibletrial.com forward slash magstv. We'll get you a 30-day free trial with Audible, along with a free ebook of your choice. And last of all, please feel free to check out my Patreon if you would like to support the channel directly. Anyways, ladies and gents, until next time, click that like button, subscribe if you want to see more, and as always, fly smart, fly safe, and I'll catch you around the verse.